Welcome to the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishur. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Now, this week on the show, we speak with Zimbabwe's Deputy Prime Minister, Arthur Mutambara. We get his views on Zimbabwe and his perspective on the African continent and on Africa's top 10. This week, we look at Africa's top 10 countries enabling trade. Welcome to the show. Guseni Oliver Mutambara is the Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. Now he's known to be a straight talker and with a background in engineering and a PhD in robotics, politics may seem an unusual choice for him. The truth is though, Mutambara entered the political fray whilst still in university and continued on this path, enduring some tumultuous periods and even arrests to finally assume office as Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe in February 2009. So what are his views on Zimbabwe and the continent at large? Let's hear from Arthur Mutambara. Arthur, thank you so much for making time to be with us. Let's take a look at Zimbabwe today. Um, amazing that you've managed to achieve uh, uh, this coalition government. Uh, Mugabe still heading the country, Morgan Changirai in place as well, and yourself. What is the state, however, of the country today? What are your thoughts? I think it was an achievement insofar as we were able to come together as Zimbabweans to say we went through a bad election, an inconclusive election, where losers were challenging the outcome of the election. So our key mandate as an inclusive government is to create conditions for freeness and fairness of our election. So that come next time around, our election will be able to produce an outcome that won't be challenged by those who have lost in that election. Meaning, we need to reform our constitution, our electoral laws, our politics, our media, do some national healing, realign our, our security sector to democracy, and also do some economic reforms. If we do those six uh, elements of reform, will be able to say our elections are going to be fair, our elections are going to be free, we are able to deliver an outcome which won't be challenged by those who have lost in those elections. Constitutional reform is critical towards forming institutions and, and building basically the foundations of the nation. How is that process going? Let's emphasize this. You see, Africa needs strong institutions, not strong leaders, you know, as Obama has indicated. We believe in that. So we're trying to make sure our country, our people are independent of personalities, but they're dependent on strong institutions, they're dependent on strong value systems. So one is having that constitution, but more importantly, we need to also cultivate and develop constitutionalism, the culture, the behavior, the tradition of respecting the constitution. Unfortunately, constitutionalism cannot be legislated. It has to be built by civic education, by social mobilization, by leading by example. So our first chapter is crafting this constitution, which document will be endorsed by everyone, but more importantly, we need to build a value system, a culture of respecting it, a culture of believing in the constitution and defending the constitution. Arthur, let's talk about you for a moment. The global community has recognized you even before you got this position um, in Zimbabwe. You were a young global leader under the World Economic Forum, also part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. What do you think your role is with such responsibility on your shoulders in terms of Zimbabwe and Africa? My role is to inspire young people and say to them, you will never be respected as an African unless Africa has done well as a continent. You could be a superstar academic in America, you could be a superstar journalist in Europe, you could be a, an outstanding business person. You must do something to make sure your Africa, the continent, has done well. Your country, Kenya, Zimbabwe, has done well. So that when you move around as a superstar, people respect you because your country has been successful. I'm emphasizing the idea of moving from success to significance. Most of these young people are very successful, but they're not significant. They are not people who have made a difference in their own countries. In other words, in that Maslow hierarchy of needs, 
let us go beyond what's, what has been called self-actualization. That's a lower stage, which is about you. Self is about you. Let's go to what we call self-transcend, go beyond self, leave a legacy. And, and so my role has been to encourage many Zimbabweans who are very successful in business, in academia, in journalism, to do something about public service, to do something about making a difference in the lives of their own people in their country. Because otherwise, we have a lot of human capital, we have a lot of uh, Zimbabweans and Africans who have done well, but they're in the diaspora. And I'm saying, even if you don't come back, in San Francisco, in Tokyo, in London, do something for your country from there. Maybe get investors for your country, maybe get ideas for your country, maybe help your government with a policy document. Always focus on what you can do for your country. The Indians have done that, the Chinese have done that, the Jews have done that. The Africans must start to realize that irrespective of where you are stationed, you are judged by the success or failure of Africa. You are judged by the success or failure of Kenya. You are judged by the success or failure of Zimbabwe. I hope that if I can do that, you know, motivate Zimbabweans to be masters of their own destiny, motivate Kenyans and other Africans to do something about their own circumstances, then I'll be successful. That's my definition of personal success. Wow, that's, that's very interesting and powerful. Let's talk about your message to people at the grassroots where there's a lot of frustration, angst. You know, when will, when will it be our time? What, what would you say? A people get a government that they deserve. I want to be very harsh on ordinary people, harsh on the people at the grassroots level, harsh on the people of Zimbabwe, the people of Kenya, the people of Africa. We must step up to the plate and determine who becomes a political leader. We must step up to the plate and determine who becomes the president of Kenya, the president of Zimbabwe. So I want people not to lose heart, but realize that they are the change they seek to see in the world. They are the ones who can make a difference. Yes, there could be laws that are repressive. Yes, there could be a culture or systems that don't promote activism. I think people have always been the creators of change, liberation, freedom, civil rights movement. The world war was fought by ordinary people. So, so I think that uh, people at the grassroots, ordinary people, must take charge of their lives by making sure they determine who becomes a councillor, they determine who becomes mayor, who becomes the candidates, by determining that during the elections they do vote and their vote does come. Yes, leaders have um, a larger role to play, but I want to emphasize that the power resides in the people and the people must exercise their right by organizing themselves, by determining who is a political leader, by determining who wins that election. However, having said that, I think leaders have a genuine obligation to open up space to enable the ordinary people to play their role. They have a genuine obligation to create rules and laws in the country that enable ordinary people. But more importantly, there's an there's a, there's a case to empower people economically. We're now moving away, Julie, from this idea of, uh, of civil rights, political rights. We're sick and tired of political rights. We're sick and tired of civil rights. We want silver rights, golden rights, economic rights. And those are? Right to a job, right to uh, health, right to education. Africans must become owners of the economy in Kenya. We must be empowered to be shareholders, not employees. We must become entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs must get access to finance. Women must have access to finance, access to land, access to markets. So economics now is what is critical. But more importantly, the message is now pan-African. We go back to Krumah, and if Krumah was alive today, Krumah would say the prosperity of Kenya is meaningless unless it is linked to the prosperity of the rest of Africa. Krumah will be talking about 21st century Pan-Africanism rooted in entrepreneurship, rooted in technology, rooted in economics. And we now need to integrate and get scale. In Zimbabwe, 13 million people is chicken change. A GDP of 10 billion people is nothing. South Africa, 50 million people. GDP, $357 billion, nothing. South Africa cannot be a proper brick unless they go as SADC, unless they go as COMESA, unless they go as the African Union. I'm saying the emphasis in Africa now should be on regional economic integration, where we present 250 million people in SADC, where we present 400 million people in COMESA, where we present a billion Africans. Now we can make sense to the Chinese with the 1.3 billion people. Now we can make sense to the Indians with 1.2 billion people. This idea of bilateral deals Kenya dealing with China, Zimbabwe dealing with China, it's unsustainable. Why? Because we get shortchanged. 
When you negotiate as a small country, you get shortchanged. But more importantly, you are more beneficial to China when you present a billion people. So I want to emphasize that the issue of um, regional integration, uh, the issue of beneficiation. We can't keep selling our, raw, our products raw. Let us move up the value chain. Let's have technology transfer from India into Africa, from China to Africa. And then we produce catalytic converters from our platinum. We produce jewelry from our diamonds. We produce coffee from our cocoa. You know, for, you know, so that we, we, we are having the farmer benefiting more from his produce. We are having the country benefit more from the oil, from the diamonds and gold. And also there's a problem in terms of our mining laws in Africa, our natural resource laws. We must make sure that the asset underground and mined has value. Right now what's happening is if an investor discovers oil, it is theirs and then they pay royalties and taxes to the government. If they discover diamonds, it's theirs. No. And we're giving claims for free. We're saying the claim underground, the rock underground, has value. The issue is to determine the value so that that value is the contribution of the people to, to mining. Absolutely. So you're calling these the silver and the golden rights. And this is the next movement for Africa. Do you think African leaders are aware of this? It's very inspirational when we hear it. And, and it makes absolute sense. And we see the regional blocs trying to get stronger. But do you believe that African leaders have totally bought into this concept? I think some of the leaders are still caught up on the past, on political rights, civil rights, right to vote. We want that as a foundation. But the aspiration now is about prosperity. Africans want to be prosperous. Africans want to be having their quality of life improved. So some of the leaders are still caught up on dogma. Some of them are still caught up on criticizing and attacking the West and history. I have no time for Africans who are, who are criticizing the West or criticizing slavery and colonialism. I am aware that those were bad things. But I'm saying Ghana has been independent for 55 years. What do they have to show for it? Kenya, about 50 years. Zimbabwe, 32 years. South Africa, 18 years. What do we have to show for it? We must become masters of our own destiny. We must become the change we seek to see in our lives. We must ask not what other countries can do for us, to paraphrase uh, JF Kennedy, but ask ourselves, as, what can we do as Kenyans? What do we control? Yes, the, the world is not fair. It was never meant to be fair. But what are you doing about those things you control? Surely in 32 years in Zimbabwe, we controlled something. And did we control it well? Surely in Ghana in 55 years, there's some things that were in the hands of Africans. And we messed up. Coup d'etats, lack of democracy, poor economic planning. Yes, I'm very aware that the geopolitics, the North, you know, is uh, taking resources from the South. The economic trade is not fair. Let's have those conversations. But we must also have an inward-looking conversation about what have we done wrong in Kenya? What have we done wrong in Zimbabwe? What can we do about it? Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. saying easily translated is let us stand up and take pride and ownership yes, of the good and the bad the, the things that have worked we take ownership the things that have not worked we don't skip gods we don't pass the buck the buck stops with us as Africans however having said that I would also want to see fair trade I would want to see the Western powers and Europe encouraging beneficiation you know it's hard enough for us to get our raw agricultural produce into Europe I'm actually interested in Europe opening up their markets for refined products, agro-processing. If we produce jewelry in Zimbabwe, I want them to open up their markets for our jewelry. If we produce catalytic converters from platinum, I want them to be buying catalytic converters from Africa into Europe, into America. If we produce cars and computers in Kenya, I want them to buy them in China and so on. So, so the debate is actually two levels. The first one is opening up the markets for the traditional products. But I'm very keen on the value-added products. 
this is where we can engage now a uh, world trade organization level and see how we can make fair trade free trade and so on but i want africans to be sophisticated enough to realize that there are things we've messed up ourselves that things we control ourselves we fix those things because we control them charity begins at home people will take us seriously when we take charge of our lives um before we wind up I'm sure people are dying to know, how has the working relationship between yourself, uh, President uh, Robert Mugabe, and uh, Prime Minister Morgan Changirai been? How have you maneuvered this relationship? I think it's been very cordial, very productive, uh, and very Zimbabwean. We've realized that there's more that unites us than that which divides us. We've realized that there is no winner in a losing team in as much as there's no loser in a winning team. So we are going to sink or swim together. And I think that has allowed us to find each other. And um, we are now fashioning what we call a national agenda, a national agenda that is above party politics. We are now fashioning a national vision, a national vision which is above party politics. We are now fashioning a national constitution, a national constitution which is above party politics. So I think that has been a very, outstanding experience and for me i've learned a lot uh working with president mugabe and perhaps the uh and as a young global leader i think i couldn't ask for a better opportunity to be at the front edge of history and uh, dealing with sadak south africa and um, it has been a unique opportunity but zimbabweans have realized that this is our country and no one else is going to make zimbabwe a peaceful prosperous and democratic country except ourselves and the three leaders have been the champion of that doctrine. Oh, very interesting, fascinating. We're all part of one team. That's a strong message, I think, that can resonate uh, across Africa and hopefully be adopted. But I want to emphasize that uh, people in SADC must take Zimbabwe as their problem. South Africa won't be attractive if Zimbabwe is problematic. South Africa won't be attractive if there are challenges in Mozambique. We are now moving away from national attractiveness to regional attractiveness. Nigeria won't be attractive if Ghana has problems. We're moving to the ECOWAS strategy. Nigeria will be attractive if the ECOWAS region is attractive. The same applies to Kenya and Tanzania. The East African community must be attractive as a region. Somalia is a key example of, of the fact that you need a strong region with, with economic and also... Because to drag everyone down. Yes. People will say, I want to go to Kenya, but I won't do so because there's a problem in, uh, this snake, in, in, uh, in Somalia. Broader than that, Africa as a continent must be attractive so that people can come to Africa. Because remember, I'm talking about a billion Africans. So Africa, South Africa won't make it, Kenya won't make it, Zimbabwe won't make it, unless the African continent is competitive as a continent, unless the African continent is attractive as a continent. So when we see these trouble sports, Sudan, uh, Mali, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Somalia, Zimbabwe. We must take them personally. We must take a vested interest approach as Africans. You will never be respected as an African until Africa has done well as a continent. Absolutely. At this point, I want you to look into that camera over there and give Africans across the continent your message. My message is that it is possible for the 21st century to be the African century. But for us to achieve this, we got to do a number of things. One is to understand that the only paradigm of survival under globalization is regional integration, continental integration. We're going to make it as a continent. Number two, we must take advantage of the ICT revolution so we can leapfrog our economies into the 21st century. Number three, we must understand that servicing the bottom of the pyramid, most of people are poor, will require different skills, will require different uh, strategies. In other words, we must have specific economic interventions that target the poor, that target the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, and encourage these banks, encourage these companies to invest in the poor. There's money to be made among poor people. If we do those three things, regional integration, embrace technology, and target the poor, as an economic source of prosperity. I think the 21st century will be the African century. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.
stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. Very interesting reflections there from Arthur Mutambara, and we certainly wish Zimbabwe all the best in its journey towards prosperity and development as well. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. This week, we asked you, what are some of the policies that can be put in place to enable productive trade in the African continent? Victor Kiyogora says, Free and secure business opportunities among the states, but the political weather should show and assure investors of stable policy. Abdi Abdi says, Put in place a regional body that will regulate and facilitate free and fair trade throughout Africa, regardless of the block they are in. This week, we look at Africa's top 10 countries enabling trade. This data was compiled from the Africa Competitiveness Report 2013, which considered market access, border administration, transport and communication, infrastructure, and the business environment. At number 10 is The Gambia, ranking at number 91 globally. At number 9 is Egypt, which ranks 90th globally. Following Egypt at number 8 is Zambia. The Southern African state is 88th in the global ranking. Malawi stands at number 7. Globally, it takes the position of 85th. 10 points ahead with a global ranking of 75th is Namibia. It stands at number 6 on Africa's top 10. Next is Morocco at number 5 on our top 10 list. It has a global ranking of 64th. South Africa is number 4 with a global ranking of 63rd. Botswana comes in at number 3 with a global ranking of 54th. At number 2, an East African nation that often makes the top 10 ranking, it's Rwanda with a global ranking of 51st. And at number 1, the island nation of Mauritius with a global ranking of 36th. It leads the pack in creating an enabling environment for trade in Africa. That's Africa's top 10 this week. Well, that's Africa's top 10 this week. What are your thoughts on that? Share them with us. We'd love to hear from you. And it brings us to the close of the show. And we leave you this week with a quote from an amazing man, the former president of Tanzania, Mualimu Julius Nyerere. He said, African nationalism is meaningless, dangerous, and anachronistic if it is not at the same time pan-Africanism. I leave you to ponder upon that thought. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa. I'm Julie Shuru. See you again next week.